Hello? You can hear? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, so every slug, I'm going to be giving these Tim tidbits until I give up or get bored. Um, this week is bash tips. So who here uses bash as their shell? Um, if you don't know what you're using, you're using bash. So that's pretty much everyone in the audience. Um, so who know here knows what tab completion is? Yes? Did you know that you can tab complete on spec commands and get it to give you the tab complete for the command rather than just like things in the directory? Like normally when you hit tab, it just lists the directory. If you source the etc bash um, underscore completion file, this will give you things like when you type git and type c and hit tab, instead of it completing to whatever starts with c in your directory, it will complete to the checkout command. Um, this is a lot more easy, uh, a lot more useful. And in exa example, if you hit tab again, it will then list your branches that you've got in git rather than the files in the directory, which is totally useless for git. So I'd highly recommend source etc bash completion. Another really great one is it works with app get. So you can type app get um, space i, hit tab, it completes to install, and then you type the start of the package name and hit tab, and it'll complete to the end of the package name. Really, really useful, saves you lots of time. Um, lots of people don't know this, um, it's surprising. I met some people who have been programming, like using Bash for years and hadn't known about it. Curly braces, who here knows what curly braces in Bash do? Like five people. So curly braces is a great way to save typing. It effectively expands, um, to two things with the curly braces replaced um, in the section. So in this example, this would expand to move Google 3 testing DER1, um, Google 3 testing DER2. So it's a great way if you say you want to exchange, um, change the extension on something, you could go mv um, my dot Open curly brace, PNG, comma, JPG, close curly brace, and that will change it to um, from a PNG to a JPEG extension. Um, obviously, that doesn't really convert the file, but <laughs> it does let you change the extension. Um, they're really, really useful. Um, they can be nested, but that's not always what you want, so be careful. Um, it's a great useful tip. People should use it more often. Multi-line input. Um, normally, you want to just echo one line, but occasionally you want to echo multiple lines into something. Um, this is how you use cat as an editor, for example. To create a test file with put this in test, ignoring quotes, and multi-line, um, this is how you do it. Uh, effectively, you go cat, then you have two less thans or greater thans, depending on which way you think. And then you type an identifier. I pretty much always use EOF, um, but you can use anything. So you could put there, say, um, foo or something. As long as it doesn't appear in your output on a line by itself, then it's fine. Um, to finish the input, you type... Um, you type the delimiter, and then you put, just type enter. So in this case, um, see here, I typed EOF and then hit enter. This part here is what ends up in the file. So if you cat this, you get put this in test, ignoring quotes, and multi-line. Um, so that's a really great way to do multi-line things on, um, on the command line. It's also a great way for to tell um, Bash to ignore any expansion in the stuff you're typing. So for example, say I want to type a command on um, this computer called compute. Normally I'd have to escape all this stuff, right? The, um, 
the pipes and the curly braces and all that type of thing would have to be escaped. By using multi-line input, I can effectively just type out what I need to do. It's a really cool way um, to get around escaping. Yes. But it still works, uh, yes. Um, who here uses bash history quite a lot? You know when you press up, it tells you the previous command you typed? Um, you can make that history a lot cleaner. Um, an example is if you export his control equals ignore dupes, then duplicate entries in history won't appear. So if you type ls and then type ls again, only one ls will appear in your history. Um, you can also ignore the same successive entry. So if you type L, um, which is slightly different, ignore dupes means that if you typed ls anywhere in your history, it won't be recorded again. Ignore dupes, uh, sorry, ignore same means that um, only if you type ls, then ls again, it will only record that once. Um, you can also tell it to ignore certain patterns in the history. Um, some commands like ls are only two characters and aren't really useful in the, um, in the bash history. I mean, who's going to search back through the history and find ls? Um, same with like foreground, background, um, saying um, exit is another great one that you probably don't want to search for because you can accidentally find it and then exit your shell, which is really bad. So you can tell it to ignore um, a whole bunch of things from going in your history. Um, who here uses bash in multiple windows at once? That's like most people. Um, it's really annoying when you close a bash shell, it's the last one that wins. So if you had a bunch of history and then you um, close that window and then close another window which didn't have that history, you lose all that stuff. So if you run this command, the eshop-h his append, um, it will append the commands to the history log rather than overwrite it, which means you get um, history from all your terminals in one thing. If you want to get the history in another terminal, so say you type it in one terminal and I want to be able to find it in another one, you can use this thing as part of your prompt command, the his-a, his-n, his-w, which will then merge all your bash histories into one and you'll be able to press control r in, say, um, one shell and find all the things you've typed in another shell. This might not be what you want, it's not for everyone, um, but it's a great way if you do want to do this. And um, last thing, I think this is the last thing, um, sops-scd spell, if you type cd and you have a slight spelling um, error in, your, um, in the directory you're trying to cd into it, it will auto um, correct it to what you meant. Um, it only works with CD. Um, it's not as powerful as the TCSH thing. Um, also, if you type the wrong line and you want, if you type the wrong thing in the line and you want to replace it um, with something else, you can use um, these upticks um, or carries as they're often called and you tell it to do replace error with the correction. It's a great way to do fix the last command manually if you type something wrong. Um, here are a couple of extra things you can put in your um, input RC to um, save yourself a couple of characters. Um, the set show all if ambiguous on saves a tab. Normally you have to hit tab twice for it to show you um, the ambiguous input. This basically tells it to do it once. Um, set visible stats on means when you type ls you get effectively ls-f instead. Um, same with things like cd. When you type hit cd and hit tab tab it will output it in ls-f format rather than the standard um, format. 
another great way to see what you're trying to tap into, whether it's a directory or symlink or those type of things. Um, Vim mode, if you're a Vim user, great way to make your shell behave more like Vim. Um, these slides will be on the net, so I'm not going to bother going through this one now because I'm pretty much out of time. And if you ever have a really, really massive command, like you've got like five pipe things and you want to change something in it, like in the beginning, often it's much better to um, open it in an editor rather than having to like move around. Um, FC will open your last command in whatever you define dollar editor. So for most people, that's their most common editor. So that's a really great way to edit really, really long command lines. You know how they kind of get really, really huge when you're piping a whole bunch of things together? This is a great way to um, edit that. I hope you learned something. Um, yep. Um, yes, I will do that. Yes, I will try and get the video up. Um, so who's listed as next? Ivan. Yep. Can see it up there. Um, do you want podium mic or hands up? Hello. Yeah. Okay, that's working. As usual, if you're looking for the most advanced talk of the night, don't look here. Um, 
basically, why, why would you want to take the teeth out of RM? So there was an article in Linux Mag lately that just said, um, do we want to take RM away from all the normal users? And I thought, yeah, I really could use that. Um, I RM the wrong stuff all the time and then have to go find a backup copy, which is a pain in the balls. Uh, sorry, pain in the butt. Um, so the <laughs> uh, default RM doesn't use do-overs. Sometimes you need one. And so it's either keep really good backups, but sometimes you don't keep good backups. So one option, safe RM. After doing a bit of a Google, I found this option. And basically, you can just go through and um, set all the different files that you don't want deleted. And the problem with that is you've got to set all the different files you don't want deleted. Not a great one for me. Another option, alias RM. Well, that sounds like a better option. So replace RM with something that um, doesn't let you stuff up so easily. Uh, pros, it doesn't require configuration. And it doesn't require you learning not to do RM like you have been for the last however long. Um, cons, uh, not all the same options. And if you MV the same file twice, you'll end up overriding your first one. So what do we do about this? Um, basically, we wrap MV in some really nasty bash uh, code. So all it is is um, take a file, move it into your trash directory, and add a timestamp so that if you do remove the same file twice, you've at least got a history of all the ones that you've um, ever done. Add that to your bash RC, and away you go. And so the benefits, it keeps a timestamp copy of the deleted files if there's more than one of the same one. It outputs what I like to call learning prompts. So every time I do uh, R or F, which MV doesn't use, it'll tell me that I should stop doing that. Um, and the benefit of this is if you go onto another machine, which you haven't already done this with, all the same commands that you use are going to work across both, except this one's a little bit safer. And uh, because MV doesn't equal RM, you're going to get a lot of warnings when you do this one and throw uh, strange little extensions at it. All your scripts are obviously going to um, error ridiculously. So one of the things that I've done here is just suppress all errors. Um, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. It doesn't fill up your console, but you never know what went wrong. OK. I've never had an original idea that I came up with on my own. Everything that you see up on this screen, I've completely ripped off someone else. So Linux Magazine, should we abolish access? I've already mentioned. And the Ubuntu forums gave me the base for the shell code that you saw earlier. Not many changes to it, and I wouldn't call any of them improvements. Um, if you do want the script for any reason, uh, grab it off the um, link, and these slides will be on the wiki. Thank you very much. I have the wiki. Uh, no, that's not it. That's not it either. Okay, I'll, I'll start talking because the first part I was actually going to talk about was this unconference I went to about wikis last Friday. And what was interesting is the setup of Number four in the list. Yeah, I can't find what I've done with this.
Oh, you have to just click on the link before you go into the slides for the actual talk. No, 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 go down. Oh, no, go down. Oh, that was photos of the people at the thing, but go down and there's actually... Sorry? Go back to the wiki. Is that what you were doing? Yeah, and click on that link, and that should take you to the That slide. one? That one, yeah. There you go, that's a slide. Should I make so... it larger? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Just leave it, it's fine. Okay, so otherwise I've forgotten what I'm going to say now. <laughs> Sorry. There um, we go. Okay, so that, that was it. Oh, the other cool thing they had was they painted all the walls um, with this special paint. So instead of just being allowed to write on whiteboard, you could write all over the walls. And that, was, that was pretty cool. Um, My kids do that already. <laughs> <laughs> University and um, there was lots of different topics, so you could put whatever topics, but it was about wikis. And I kind of tied my own interest because the talks, because one of the other things that happened was Aguimo put something up saying OXML was going to be the Australian government standard. And so I thought, Aha, I'll, I've got a talk I can, I can do, was whether wikis would replace word processing and. Um, in, in organisations, so and that them being open and inter interoperable, and I guess we just had a demo of what the problem is when you use proprietary systems which aren't open and on the net. Um, and but then there was a whole lot of people at the wiki talk at the conference wanting to talk about printing from wikis, <laughs> <laughs> which is like going backwards a step. And then I realised that if we're actually all writing word processing for printing and then slapping the bloody PDFs on the web. So it's it's all a bit odd. So anyway, um, that that was just an observation from the conference. Um, one of the other problems we actually had at the conference was interesting is that they locked the wiki. So instead of actually being able to contribute to it while we were there for three days, that was the end of that. So that was actually a bit of a lesson. And and it was a, I think the the wiki was being run from the US and obviously someone was was um, hacking into it and so they just shut it shut down for security. So that was the end of that. So I think in the end, after the conference, apparently it's been written up on Wikiversity. So there's actually links to all that in my paper. This is these slides are part of the paper, which I notes I wrote from the conference. And then the last thing was, will in fact the catalyst to move to Wikis from Word doc, uh, from um, Office, Open Office, or Microsoft Office be that we want to incorporate rich video, audio into our documents, which I think wikis and, can, and HTML basically can handle a lot better and HTML5. So that was my talk. Um, one of the things that came up on the list, and I don't know if the people who, were, who commented about it were there, was that the government's just re issued a policy about open source purchasing. So if anyone wants to say anything, now's your chance. Okay, that's it. You need to do it on both monitors. Both monitors? Yeah. Max have a strange thing on the 60 hertz? Yep. That one there.
Is it on? Yeah, that's fine. Apparently not. First things first, just an update on multimedia on Linux. Last time I was here, I talked a little bit about our door. Didn't have a computer to show you, so I thought I'd give you a, a bit more of an overview this time. Sorry. What? All right. So uh, this this is our door. Hello. It's not working again. You can hear that? All right, fine. So Ardor is the premium uh, multi-tracking suite editor for Linux, but it also runs on Mac, not Windows. Um, and it's coming up to the alpha release for the third iteration of this amazing software. Uh, one of the cool things is that it has MIDI functionality built into it, which makes it a pretty powerful system. It also does unlimited tracks and sends and buses and all sorts of other cool stuff. Um, the guys from Harrison Consoles make a embedded hardware system running Ardor as the main engine and Jack as well, and that's installed at the it's the largest uh, movie editing console in the world at Universal Studios, I think, something like two, three hundred tracks or something like that. Um, and then they've also got this thing called Mixbus, which is a very elegant solution for mixing multiple tracks, and it has all the console MIDI functionality built into it. Um, now, with... The latest outdoor, there's also some plugins that are being released. This is uh, built on this uh, platform called LV2, which is LAD, no, LADSPAR, yeah, LADSPAR version 2. Um, and that gives you very powerful and feature rich user interfaces. So, for example, this is a new plugin made by the Linux DSP crew. Uh, which is a EQ with lots of different e uh, features built into it. Um, and they also have some other software that they're releasing, these track editors, channel EQs and stuff like that. Uh, so you can see that the user interface design has progressed quite a lot over the past couple of years, especially for... LV2 plugins and the Ardor interface is also pretty slick these days, given that they've had about five years of professional funding and support from Harrison and SAE and other companies that have a vested interest in making things look pretty. Okay, um, so that's that's an overview there of the Ardor system. And then I was going to go on to Open Octave MIDI. This is a new, brand new release 
which is a fork of a MIDI editing system called Muse. Um, a bit controversial about why they forked it, but I won't go into that. What they've done is they've added in support for professional uh, classical composition features and also um, movie composition and tracking um, sort of standard components that you would expect if you came from a Windows or a Mac platform. Uh, and they just released that about a week ago. Uh, the, the interesting thing about it is it's designed specifically for very, very large MIDI tracking um, projects. So if you're talking about 300, 500 MIDI tracks where you've got you know, a very powerful system to run it on and you're, you're working in a professional music system, this is the kind of thing that people have been waiting for for quite a while, and now it's available. Uh, and then the, the Laddie guys, they did a release, updated their session handling system to have support for multiple studios. They call them studio spaces with multiple rooms in each studio space which are able to talk to each other. So you can have multiple studios talking to each other, multiple rooms talking to each other in multiple studios. You know, it gets pretty complex, but they've given that power now in their system. Um, that ties into some of the changes that were made to Jack last at the end of last year, which added a, a basic functioning session uh, API in, internally in Jack so that you can have a, a desktop set up with your various different audio and video tools all feeding into the Jack system and then you can press the save button and they will all save their state at the same time allowing you to basically have a sleep type functionality or a, a project save restore type functionality especially useful when you have the modular environment, which the Jack system kind of encourages. Uh, and those, those are the main updates over the past few months for Linux Audio. There's lots of other stuff, but probably too little or too many to kind of mention. Then the other big thing was on the Blender side of things. Uh, last time I was here, I talked about Blender and... Uh, a couple of other tools that people are using for multimedia production and, and game production and stuff. But the main thing was that they were just about to release their latest open movie project called Sintel, which they have now released. And uh, it was pretty successful from what I heard. And I actually downloaded the full 2048 by 782 OGV file today. I'm not sure if it's uh, appropriate to watch it here on the larger screen or not, but if we want to see it now, we could. It takes about eight to ten minutes, I think. Can leave it till last, I don't mind. Watch it now. We, we, even though I'm running it on a Mac, I will use VLC, which is open source. That's fine. What should I do? Just pull it out? Yep. Um, who's next? Do you want to use this or the handheld? Please don't walk around too much. Come on. Close that. Nope, that's Neil's talk. 
That's Neil's talk too. That's your talk. And you can see your face in that corner. That is. Testing, testing. Yes. Good you know. um, I found DuckToe a couple of months ago. And um, as it says, it's an easy file transfer tool designed for land use. We also use it over wireless as well. Dead easy install. Simplest thing you can. Uh, pressing up, Tim, and it's not doing anything. Oh, there we go. That's the one I want. This is directly from their website. I'm taking a tip from taking a hint from Neil here. I didn't write any of this. <laughs> None of it is my idea. Simple user interface, and I'll show you the GUI for it later on. Dead easy. Um, you don't need a server or internet connection. You just need to have two machines that can connect to each other. No configuration. Seriously. Um, auto discovery. Dead easy. High, it is a high speed file transfer. As fast as your network will manage. No installation needed. You don't download a file, you unzip it, and that's your file. Uh, there's no configuration file, no registry. In fact, there's nothing in it apart from a nice little logo, which you'll see up in the top left-hand corner there. Uh, you can do multi-files or folder transfers, transfer log. You keep, it gives you a transfer log. It is free and open source. Uh, runs on Macs, uh, Windows, and Linux. And you can also install it on Nokia phones like my N8. Any, any Nokia phone running Symbian. Next one. This is how you use it. You download it from the site, and the site address is at the top of the page there. You untie the file, or you enter the directory, and you start Ducto. In this one, it was revision 2 that I've got. And the GUI looks like that. The thing that you do is you drag that to the left-hand side of your desktop, you grab a file or a folder and you drop it in that window and it will transfer it to your buddy. So in my case, when I want to transfer something to my phone, say a video or something to my, to my uh, mobile, uh, like a video that I've made or that I want to watch on the mobile, all I do is switch Ducto on, on my phone and on the desktop, my phone automatically appears in the window for the desktop and the reverse for the phone and then drag it, and that's it. It is dead simple, easiest thing to use, and that's a lightning talk. Nothing complicated about it. It takes you 30 seconds to install, and it takes you five seconds to start using it, and that's shorter than the length of this talk. Thanks. So this might be a little bit tricky to get to work
I'm saying stuff. I'm saying lots of stuff. And I'm... What? <laughs> Slides updating okay? Yep. Oh, awesome. Um, so, normally the way that, uh, say, Apache works is that you have uh, one thread, one process handling a resource at a time. So, when you ask for a page, there'll be one process um, handling that. And you need as many processes as there are um, requests um, per page. And that's whether you're serving PHP, whether it's CSS, static files, you know, images. All that sort of stuff. You need a single process for every single request to serve. Um, and so in this example, we have all these um, hamsters coming and getting uh, info from the server bunny. Um, but the problem with that is that they start queuing up. So if you don't have enough bunnies, they have to wait and wait and wait um, for things to be served. Uh, if you had a hyperactive squid that did things really, really, really quickly, that did 
being vulnerable about having multiple um, threads and processes, um, you can handle that very fast. And this is exactly what Nginx and Node.js do. Um, and uh, yeah, so queuing input output, you're doing it wrong. Um, here's some examples of Nginx versus Apache uh, in terms of memory usage. Uh, as you can see, uh, the more concurrent connections you have, going up to about 4,000 in this graph, Apache uses buttloads of memory, um, Nginx uses roughly consistent amount of memory. Uh, and this graph is a little bit um, wonkers. It's, it's uh, based on the previous graph, but essentially um, you can handle more requests per second at uh, uh, concurrent, higher concurrent connections with Nginx than you can Apache. Um, it's hard to read because it's based on the previous graph. I'll skip past this. Um, here's the difference between serving stuff with Apache uh, versus serving stuff with Nginx. Uh, basically, I put Nginx in front of Apache on this server and served all of the static files with Nginx. And as you can see, the memory usage of Apache um, just completely disappeared. Uh, only the uh, dynamic stuff was being served by Apache in these examples. Why JavaScript? Um, it turns out that despite being built browser, uh, it's, it's actually the perfect language for this use case because it's designed to be hosted, you know, doing this hosting in a browser. It's single threaded, you don't have to worry about multiple threads or anything like that. It's based on, a, on an event loop as a language construct. So it's not like a library or a framework like, uh, for instance, Python's Twisted or Ruby's event machine. It's actually part of a language. So you're sort of not doing anything weird, you know, um, having to muck around with the way that you, you're using it um, in order to make the, um, the uh, event loop stuff work. Uh, so it makes it totally natural to do event loop programming. Uh, here's an a very, very quick example of uh, doing stuff uh, with Node. It's basically the, the hello world with Node uh, because HTTP is a basic primitive in Node because it's designed to do really cool and cool stuff. So essentially what you're doing here creating a web server, you have a function uh, that runs every time the server receives a connection, uh, you pass that to create the server. Uh, inside that function, um, we write a header, so 200 was the success code, uh, we set content type text plane, and then we uh, end um, what we're writing to the connection, not when we're not closing the connection to the server, we're just finishing off what we're writing and sending it back to the client, uh, hello world, that's a bit of a shortcut. Uh, and then we listen on port 8000. Now, I, at uh, LCA, I did a little example uh, based on a later version of this uh, and hosted it on my netbook and let people use it. Uh, and they couldn't uh, they couldn't overload my netbook. You can see the CPU graph going up and down and up and down. They couldn't overload the netbook. Um, and that's basically the output of Node when you do that. Um, the more interesting example is this one here where uh, you have a timeout running in the code, and you you do the rest. That you you finalize um, the data that you're sending to the connection two seconds after you send the first block. Um, so now there's a, there's a funny little bug in this one, which is fixed in this version. But you can see my slides later. Basically, it looks like this, and then pops up like that. Uh, and uh, uh, Node has done some funky stuff to to automatically. Uh, anyway, it's awesome for doing uh, RESTful uh, web services because it does concurrent stuff um, and, and handles tiny little requests really, really quickly. So if you're running uh, a, web, a web service of some kind, um, it's awesome for that. It's really cool for real-time things. Um, best example at the moment is things like Comet, Long Polling, and um, the new hotness in HTML5 called WebSocket. There's a great um, library for Node called Socket.io. Basically what it does is it uses every kind of possible um, HTTP hack to do something like WebSockets if it can't do WebSockets. It, is, it even has a, a version of WebSockets written in Flash that you can use that. Um, and people are using it to write real-time games and all sorts of awesome stuff. Um, and I built a, a Twitter client um, using 
sockets for streaming the Twitter updates directly from the Twitter server, uh, and really nice and fast and, and very easy to use. Um, running long on time. I think I've pretty much gone over time already. <laughs> I thought I'm running low, so I'll use that as much as I possibly can. Um, very quickly, the reason why people love Node.js and why people are going completely gaga for it, like they did about Rails about four years ago. Um, firstly, it pulls together really, really cool open source projects into a very, very tight, uh, easy to understand uh, project. Um, so this is the stack diagram. Uh, bottom left hand corner, you've got uh, libEV, which is like libEvent, but a, sort of a newer version. It basically does um, the fastest possible main loop processing that your OS can <laughs> So you know, on, on really, really old Unixes, you'd be stuck with, say, select or poll. Uh, uh, on the latest stuff, you'd be using KQ, poll, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's your main loop. EIO does uh, evented IO, uh, and it does kind of little hack and the thread pool. So, because for operating systems that don't actually do asynchronous IO, but those two sort of sit together. Um, C Ares is uh, an asynchronous uh, DNS client. Uh, it is fantastic for uh, handling DNS because most operating systems don't do async DNS. HTTP parser was written by the author of Node.js, Ryan Dahl, uh, and it does uh, really, really fast native uh, parsing of uh, HTTP 1.1. Uh, OpenSSL is always a black sheep in the family. It's a piece of crap, but you know, kind of need it. Um, then there's V8, the Chromium uh, uh, JavaScript VM. It's insanely fast, insanely fast. Uh, and mo more recent versions have got even faster. Again, since Node.js started, it's uh, heaps of fun. Uh, and in Node.js, it's actually this nice little slim blob on top, um, a little bit of C++ to bind all of these things together, uh, and a little bit of JavaScript, uh, and, that, and the, the share between C++ and JavaScript has changed over time. Nowadays, it's much more JavaScript than C++, um, and that exposes the, the node APIs to applications. Um, beautiful open source project. The maintainer kicks ass. This is Ryan Dahl. He's kind of the Tridge humble maintainer rather than the Linux. Some other systems, there's no weird looking exceptions. The other thing is, most JavaScript stuff is designed for uh, an event loop uh, and doesn't block. Um, so because you have to write bindings for Node, um, if you want to if you want to use other native code, then most of the stuff you end up using in Node doesn't block at all, which is great. Um, brilliantly simple common network programming primitives. So you can do DNS, Unix socket. Linux sockets, TCP, UDP, all that kind of stuff, and they're really, really simple and straightforward. Um, then there's a bunch of other stuff. It only runs on XZ6, 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 and ARM. Um, 02x is crappy SSL and TSL support, but 03 is uh, coming out. Uh, sorry, 04 is coming out soon, um, which vastly improves on that. Uh, there's a best efforts window, Windows port, which I think will improve greatly. Um, in the next few versions. Uh, and the, the yucky thing is that V8 has a mock on 90 by default, which is a little bit problematic, especially on 64 bit systems, you wouldn't expect that. Um, but I think over time, V8 people will sort them out. Uh, anyway, I don't think there's really much else in here um, to go through, but I'll have my slides up on uh, uh, at some point. And you can also watch the video of the entire talk uh, on the LCA website. Time's up. Any questions? Or don't I get questions? Thank you, Jeff. I hope that was enjoyable. Thanks, Jeff. Hello everyone again. Um, there's a New South Wales election coming up. 
Um, Is it? Apparently. Uh, I have no idea who's running or anything like this. I, I'm not really politically active. Um, um, so, but last week at LCA, um, I got together with Hanari and we decided that election leaflets should work for the New South Wales state election. Who here knows what election leaflets is? Uh, most people don't. So everybody knows what an election leaflet Right, you get them in your mailbox, and they say all these things about how the government is going to solve all your problems and make all the bad people go away, and all these type of things. Um, so what we're trying to do is basically have you scan, take a photo, or do anything like that, and upload them onto the web, so you can see election leaflets from all the way around Australia. Um, we did it for the federal election. Um, so um, when we finally fix it, you'll be able to see the ones from the previous federal election, um, and you can see all the um, like lies. you can see yeah the lies that they're saying. Uh, there's been quite a few scandals about election leaflets, right? Um, does anybody remember the um, scandal in Lindsay about um, the highly racist um, election leaflets? Um, recently in Queensland, there was a um, person putting out, a Liberal person putting out an election leaflet that looked like it was from the Greens. It was like in the Greens colours and all that type of thing. So you're not going to know about any of these things unless you're in those election um, areas. With election leaflets, you can find out about all the different election leaflets, even if you're not in those locations. But we really need your help to do this. So. When you get these election leaflets, instead of just throwing them out, take a picture with your phone or scan them in at work and send them to the election leaflets website so that we can um, see what's happening in the New South Wales um, election. It's going to be a pretty bitter election from what I hear from people who are more politically savvy than I am. Um, so please go there, upload your election leaflets. Um, would really appreciate that. Thank you very much. I have no idea. There's some, there's some special thing about them because they have to be registered with the party and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, please upload them. Thank you very much. Um, who's next? John, do you have slides? Okay. I, can people hear that? Is that? Uh, I don't think that's coming through the mic, is it? Okay. Is that? Okay. That's coming through. Okay. My name's John August. I think it's probably the closest thing to a talk I've done for Slug for perhaps ten years or more. But uh, I guess I've been interested in open source for quite some time. I guess I've also been interested in justice and injustice in the world. I think that's what you call a moral struggle. And I guess I've had my own moral struggle as I've tried to make sense of injustice in the world, um, you know, of everything going from workplace bullies to, you know, the injustice of globalisation. And I guess in the middle we have laws and we have the economic system and the economy. And you know, on top of all that, there's open source. And I guess I've been quite interested in open source in times past and wondered, you know, what, what is it that we're doing um, how are we affecting the world? Are we making it a better place? What, what are we doing? What are we challenging? And, you know, I, I suppose I, lots of people give talks on intellectual property or the nature of open source and cathedral and the bazaar and so on. But, you know, I guess I've had my own uh, personal struggles with those ideas. And, uh, you know, I guess we have a life around us which is partially a social thing and partially an economic thing. We go out and we buy things. We, I guess we might also talk to each other and collaborate on things. And I guess that's one of the things where open source is an interesting one because we can actually go out and buy stuff. 
And sometimes when we go out and buy stuff, you know, the world is becoming a better place. And that's one of the things that I reflect on as I struggle with the nature of the economy. Is it good or bad? Is it good or bad to have people going out and making stuff and, and selling it to others? And uh, one of the things is that where that tends towards injustice, I perhaps, guess perhaps people are selling addictive substances or, or gambling or things like that. And, you know, basically you can sell bad things or you can sell good things. And you can also control your information, manipulate and have monopolies. And perhaps that's a bit of where open source is coming from. It's challenging some of those things that we might see as being evil in the economy. But at the same time, we're using computers, consuming computers, buying things. Are they being recycled? What's happening along the way? So there's a few layers going on there. And uh, so it's a matter of what the cooperation of open source. Now, how is that actually challenging injustices in the economy? Are these injustices an overall bad thing or are they just a few evil corporations that are doing evil things? And I suppose I've sort of moved away from the corporations that sell software and thought to myself, you know, I'm doing a good thing in the world, I'm waving my fist around, I'm, I'm charging out there and, and, and sort of make, making a point with what I do. But I guess it is a big world and there are a lot of threads there because the other thing I also think is, you know, here's open source and, you know, what about the injustices of, you know, your third world dictators and, uh, you know, the, the sweatshops in China and so on. There's a lot of injustice in the world and it's all over the place and I guess open source is an attempt at fixing one little injustice and making a change off in one corner. And I suppose over time I've started to realise that's a worthwhile place but I think I probably deluded myself on its significance. There's a lot of injustice out there in the world and I guess open source is addressing one part of that larger, part, larger story of injustice. So uh, that's, I think, I'll bring bring to the close. It's it's sort of a bit of a personal journey of my moral struggle as I've sort of related to the world and tried to come to grips with it. Uh, so I can't really say that I've moved along and come to a conclusion, but there's a there, there's there's some of the journey that I've been on. Anyway, thank you. So I sent myself a little project the other week to uh, try to teach myself a little bit of Python. And I came I, at about the same time, I came across uh, Google's Translate API. Uh, most of you would probably be aware that Google has a Translate service that you can type it in the text box and it does a Translate. There's also a Translate UP, uh, API. So if you put a code, a URL, something like this, uh, you'll see in, in that URL I have the version number of the translate engine I'm going to use, which doesn't seem to make any difference, the piece of text that I'm going to translate, and what language I'm translating from and to. So in this case, Russian to Dutch. And it responds much the same as any other web page, but with a much cut down, more precise answer, with literally the single word translation. So I then went and took that and used Python 
And uh, there's a program called Parlay that uh, some of you may be aware of. It's a KDE program. And it takes a, a XML file like this that has a whole bunch of uh, information about uh, translating one word to, its, to another in another, another language. The idea being that you could uh, have the program will show you flashcards to learn the other language. So this particular uh, XML file has uh, German, Arabic, and you can see up here, you got uh, each one of these fields identifies the language. And you can see that they got this one is English. And the next one down here somewhere identifies German. And then further down, you actually have the entries. So here, let's go on more about uh, def defining the language. And so here you have the first entry, and you have the entry ID 0, so the translation ID 0. So that's English, and you've got the English word for squirrel. And then it's the next language here, you've got the translation ID 1, which was the German, if you remember back at the one up ahead, back uh, above. And you've got the German translation. So what I wanted to do was write a Python script. Sorry? Uh, no. No, I'll skip that bit. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is write a Python script that would use Google's Translate to add another language to this XML file. So what the script does is it goes through and passes the XML data uh, using Python's XML uh, library. And it then goes through and for each one of these entries, goes and for each entry in it, each translation within that entry, goes and gets the, say for instance, the Dutch uh, translation for that word. So the first entry here, as, as we're looking at here, is squirrel. And it will go get, it'll use the word scroll and say, okay, give me the English to Dutch translation and get the Dutch word for it. It'll then use the German entry here for scroll and get the German to Dutch translation for it. And then basically it takes the longest answer because some translations might have the scroll and in some languages the is important because it's different word for the depending on whether it's a masculine, feminine uh, object. And it also gets the one, the translate, it keeps the translation that is occurring more often. So if the translation, the Dutch translation is, translation A occurs three times, translated from, say, German, French, whatever, and the, the translation B occurs only once, well then, chances are the first translation is, is right because it occurred three times in three separate translations. So it then then, so this is the script here and uh, they have a nice little, uh, where is it now? Just give me a second. I should have looked at this before. Where is it? Here. Yeah. So it goes and forms the code. There's objects within the XML uh, library within Python that allows you to put in the information you want to seek to form the URL a little bit easier. So you can see here I've got the language pair and I'm specifying I've got the language pair and here I've got my the language I'm getting it from and the language I'm getting it to and that basically ends up constructing this URL it then goes and gets the answer. It does the inquiry. Uh, so that's where it forms the URL. And here it goes and says, okay, get me the... One moment. I've lost where I was. Yeah. So that command there then goes, gets the URL and gets that answer back. And then the, the rest of the XML is basically using XML code to put it back into the original XML file. So as you then have this XML file that now has an additional language other than the four that it originally came with. The problem I have is that um, Google doesn't like having so many requ requests so quickly. So after, in my testing of this, I started getting responses that didn't look like this anymore, but ended up looking up 
with an error code. And the error code said something like, uh, I think you're spam, go away. And <laughs> so at first I thought, okay, well, I'll put a delay in. And every time I saw that, that error code, I basically said, okay, wait a couple of seconds, try again. And if I hit the error code again straight away, wait twice as long this time. And that worked for a while, and then eventually get Google banned me altogether. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the error message does have a web address, and I follow the web address, and it goes um, and says, uh, basically terms and conditions, don't use this in an automated script, which of course this is. So there is a, apparently an API you can call, you can uh, request, and that gives you a little bit more leniency because they then know who you are and you're proving who you are. But uh, I suspect, suspect that if I keep this program as it is, they'll probably still end up banning me by the time I get through this file, which has 1,800 entries and four languages in each of those entries. Uh, so I'm going to have to do some restructuring. My plan is to basically, instead of doing it one entry at a time, form a list of 100 words, say a German list of 100 German words, and send that to translate and get in response a list with 100 Dutch words and then go through and correlate them again and then repeat for the other languages. That should re reduce the number of requests down to, I don't know, a couple of hundred or something like that, as opposed to four times 18,000, 1,800. And hopefully then Google won't ban me. It works from here. I can't show you the error because it works from here because when I'm logged in here, I'm coming to Google with a different IP address. So obviously it's not banned me from here. But And that's about it. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Account or something? That's it.